Thank you, Hasse. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the Fellows community this year and really an honor to count uh, some of the people who've inspired me the most as now my peers here. Um, so I'm really thankful to be here. Uh, if you're tweeting during the talk, please use the Berkman hashtag. And uh, my Twitter handle is S-M-W-A-T, S-M-W-A-T. Um, so this talk is really a reflection of a lot of the work I've been thinking about for a long time here as a, and, and here as a fellow. Um, but it's also a proposal for future work. So I'm really interested in feedback um, from the brain trust in the room and those out watching on the web. Um, really, my main idea here is that we need more stories that ground data in personal, everyday experience. We need personal data stories that make data uses intelligible and impacts personal. So my way of building that case today is to talk a little bit about my own personal encounters with uh, data very recently, um, why I think understanding data matters now, and how personal uh, data stories can help us understand data. And then I'll walk through a few exemplary stories that I think really uh, encapsulate this um, kind of story that I'm talking about. And then I have a pitch and a call for stories for you. Um, so first, I wanted to start off by talking about what I do and do not know about myself as other entities see me through my data. So Facebook advertising engine seems to think that I really like cheese boards. Um, <laughs> even when they aren't selling cheese, like in the Stella Artois example, um, they are throwing this image up to me more than occasionally. And so I can try to figure out what's going on here. Uh, I can think that maybe I said the word cheese board and it's generating these uh, perfectly targeted ads. Or it could be that uh, image recognition is taking this cover photo that I put up on my profile page and realizing that, like, yes, she really does like cheese boards. Um, but I can't tell if Facebook thinks I'm demographically bougie or if it really knows that I'm obsessed with cheese. So when I look at About the Data, which is Axiom, the data broker's uh, consumer interface into the um, profile information that they've collected from behavioral targeting, I can see that uh, Axiom thinks I am a truck owner and I have an intention to purchase a vehicle soon, neither of which is true. <laughs> I'm assuming that this has to be based on my father's previous truck ownership, and maybe uh, he, he owned a truck in like the 1990s, so it's probably even coming from DMV <laughs> records. Um, and for some reason, my address had been associated with my parents' address because I've been moving around a lot, and that's where a lot of my credit cards and things were uh, forwarding to for a long time. So when but I, so I can try to kind of parse why it would think that I am interested in trucks. But I still don't know uh, what Axiom thinks I'm, what Axiom thinks that means that I like trucks or I'm interested in trucks. I can't tell if Axiom thinks I'm a truckin' and stylin' or outward bound consumer, one of the many consumer segmentation profiles that might link to this truck data point. Um, Axiom shows us this inferred demographic information, but they're not telling us how somebody else might want to use it, like a marketer or perhaps an insurance company or a loan underwriter. So then when I started to worry about the traces of my connections to friends uh, in my time abroad in the UK and in China, I realized that I can use Facebook graph search to query how many people in my network I do know in China, even the ones that happen to be on Facebook. Um, who show up in my buddy list is, and in the way that the PRISM documents have described this, this concept of foreignness. But I have no confidence in any way that I don't meet the threshold for confidence-based citizenship, as it were. I don't know what it means to be a person on a buddy list associated with a foreign power, um, nor do I know whether my use of VPN would contribute to this score. So my algorithmic algorithmically determined citizenship is completely opaque to me. So these are just some examples of the personal account encounters I've been having in my daily life, from the very trivial in the commercial and cheese boards to something quite consequential in talking about my shifting sense of my own citizenship. And these concerns all point to a certain kind of asymmetry that 
is really obscuring what's going on be behind the scenes and the interactions that I can try to begin to understand, but I am blocked. And so I think the real crux of the problem is uh, that we don't understand the causal relationship between our data and its uses in the world. Joanne McNeil has described this as reading the algorithmic tea leaves, which I really like. It's a dark art. We don't understand the how and the why of data's uses, let alone what our data forecasts about us. I like to think about it as a kind of uncanny valley of personalization that we're in right now. When we try to understand the creepy ads that follow us around or are strangely personal, we can't figure out if it's just course de uh, demographics or hyper-targeted machine learning that generates the ads we see and leaves us with the sense of the uncanny. So this kind of gets to this, uh, <coughs> all this data is uh, making our behaviors and our habits and our interests more legible to firms and governments. And as consumer, consumers, we haven't yet developed the critical uh, literacies to understand what our data is saying, saying about us, and more importantly, how it's shaping our experience. So the other day, a medical professional said to me when I was talking about my upcoming talk that uh, I have nothing to hide. If they profile so that a terrorist doesn't blow up the plane that I'm taking to Disney with my kids, I'm OK with that. Now, I started thinking about it, and I realized what he, what he was talking about was only one use that one use he was thinking was justified, that the da data was targeting to stop a terrorist. But I couldn't help but think that uh, he might be going to Disney and he would find their magic bands that they're uh, beta testing right now where they're tracking basically all of your activity all throughout Disney. It's your pass in the door at your hotel. It's the pass to go on the rides. It is your quantified Disney experience. <laughs> So when we, ha when we say we have nothing to hide, I'm, I'm trying to try to understand how can we know what we have to hide from if we don't know how data is being used. Right now, data is a big black box. It's hard to develop opinions and feelings about what we think should happen with data when most of that is happening behind the scenes. It's obscured and opaque. The flows of data and its uses are hidden. So when I started worrying about personal data a while ago, writing about it from the CIO's perspective, I thought that we had an awareness problem in the public. People didn't understand that by using free services, we were paying for, uh, paying for them with our data, as it were. I think we've moved far beyond that, um, and Snowden has heightened awareness even further. So right now we're in a moment where we're primed to have a discussion about how we want our data environment to look yet we have only scratched the surface about how our data is actually being used. I think this is a particularly important moment because we're moving from a time when data existed about our browsing habits and our mobile experience to a time when more of the physical world is being tracked and measured and becoming data. Our cities, our cars, our homes, our bodies are all extending our data profile. Anything with a sensor becomes fodder for this larger socio-technical system that we're building. So we're also transitioning into a time when we intentionally search for things we want, and search interfaces clearly delineated paid advertisements to an interface that anticipates our needs and gives us small bits of information at a time in the early iterations uh, of Google Now. Our choice architectures fall away as interfaces become more embedded and anticipatory. So <clears throat> we're learning to live with data as more of our domestic life become subject to, to, to digital scrutiny, uh, but the ways we interpret and influence the uses of data are about to shift dramatically. So my proposal is this. We need stories that make data uses more intelligible and its impacts more personal. We need new tools for thinking about data's role in our everyday lives. <clears throat> we need stories to be relatable. They need to go beyond I have nothing to hide mentality to illustrate the ways our environments are shaped and influence us. We need more personal stories to make the uses of data more intelligible and more practical. We need stories that bring data back from the big data scale back down to a human scale. I think in order to have better conversations about our evolving norms and feelings about appropriate uses of data, we need to make the uses of data more legible. 
that's the only way we'll be able to hold uh, governments and corporations accountable for their data practices. So now I want to walk through a couple canonical personal data story examples uh, to work through th that work at opening the black box and making personal effects of data uh, legible. So by now, you have all heard about this example. The New York Times profiled the algorithms that looked at purchasing patterns to identify early pregnancy indicators. It also included a story about how the pregnancy coupons reached one family in particular. The father of the household brought it back to Target, inquiring as to why they would ever send pregnancy-related coupons to his teenage daughter, only to find out that it turned out she was, in fact, pregnant. Now, this story has become canonical, in part because it does a lot to educate us about what was actually going on behind the scenes and how they were determining uh, second trimester pregnancy, but it also tells us the impacts of a practice and it makes them concrete by dealing the social impacts on this particular family. More recently, Mike C, I'm not sure I know how to pronounce his name, but Mike C received a direct mail envelope from Office Max that included daughter killed in car crash in the address. This failure exposed just how egregious the market segmentations uh, from data brokers could actually be, and it exposed the kinds of lists that data brokers are keeping on us, and the source of information they think is relevant. But how might that information be used, and more importantly, how should it be used? Clearly, this was a failed use, uh, <laughs> but how might it otherwise be being used? This story connected the personal effect of an insensitive reminder of the loss of a child in its traumatic event and implicated Office Max for its use, as well as the data broker for its database classification. We began to understand some, like, how something like this could happen, and now it's an example of this failure. And um, this is actually my story that I wrote in The Atlantic, which is linked on the event page. Um, so I had deliberately chosen not to update my Facebook status when Nick and I got engaged because I didn't want to show up in the database very intentionally. But then Facebook one day asked me how well I knew him and also displayed an ad for a custom engagement ring right next to each other. It turned out when we asked Facebook what was going on that it was a, a coincidence and that the service enhancing survey to improve the relevance of my newsfeed happened to match up with a de demographically determined ad. These two pieces were run by different algorithms. But the confidence, the coincidence didn't lessen the effect of feeling as though Facebook had intruded on my personal life. And even after talking with Facebook to confirm what was going on and that, what is, that it was a fluke, I still had no answer as to what factors went into the algorithm that asked about Nick as opposed to any of my other friends as a person of interest. Was it the sheer number of images we were tagged in together or increasingly overlapping networks? I have no idea. I still don't know, also, if I was getting this engagement ring ad just because I was a female between the ages of 18 to 35 without a relationship status, or if it was because a more complex series of behaviors across the site alerted Facebook that it seemed like Nick and I were getting more serious. My Facebook stories show that even though the ad and the user uh, survey were coincidentally coincidentally displayed together, its effect on me was not incidental. So what is it about these personal data stories? They detail the effects of data and algorithms on our everyday lives. They aren't about data breaches where we have no idea if we are affected or not, or, or sh should we be worried. Data stories explain what's going on behind the scenes. They give us more information about how these black boxes are actually working, but they also give us a framework and a vocabulary to begin to interrogate these data environments. They expose the logic of the engineers building these systems, their science, data science practices, and the reasons for their inter interventions. And they detail the consequences of design decisions and power structures. Data stories are also concrete. They happen to real people. They are not obscured behind big data rhetoric. They are grounded in individual experience. They give us a sense of what it means to be a digital person today, and they describe the dynamics of our roles as consumers and citizens and individuals are changing. I first really became interested in personal data stories about data in my research in the quantified self community. 
I found that individuals were using numbers as storytelling devices. The show and tell format is quite literally a narrative using data. These data stories are full of thick description uh, and leave room for discussion about the individual, their feelings, their interpretations, and their sense of self. Like the personal data stories in the quantified self, show and, presentation, show and tell presentations, personal data stories I'm interested in are about identifying personal meaning or the effects, of the effects on the individual through understanding the uses of data. But most importantly, I think these personal data stories have the potential to restore the subjectivity of individuals to an otherwise objective medium of data. But personal data stories are really hard to tell. This is actually a Reddit comment. I know I should not read them. Oh. In response to my Atlantic article, and it indicates the trouble of telling personal stories and the subtlety of talking about privacy from the database rather than privacy from people. It's not just the internet trolls that make data, personal data stories challenging to tell, though. Data stories are hard to discover. Individuals are, aren't necessarily primed yet to be critical of these patterns. And the strange things that happen when there is a coincidence or a fluke or a change in the design that exposes something interesting. These rifts reveal the seams of the system, but they're hard to see. Personal data stories are also anecdotes. Sometimes uh, the effects are technically repeatable, but often not. And they are exceptional, uh, and so by big data standards, they are not statistically significant. Data stories also need resources to reverse engineer what is going on, or you need skills to be able to sandbox to build out hypothetical digital profiles to compare and contrast outcomes. Or you need the journalistic clout to get a response from Facebook to figure out uh, if what you see is relevant or uh, intentional or not. And so in that sense, these stories can be taken out of the voice of the individual affected and end up appropriated by journalists. It's also challenging to tell these stories with any nuance. There is risk always in sensationalization, sensationalizing uh, the concerns, and of course the target um, story is certainly an example of that. There is a delicate balance in highlighting these exceptional cases and grounding it in the effects on our everyday lives. Personal data stories also risk the personal privacy of the individuals involved uh, by heightening their profile and their plight. There's also a danger uh, of personal attacks on these stories, i.e. Reddit. <laughs> but these stories are all the more compelling if they come from real customers, con real consumers. Uh, if we can answer the questions they have, we can get at the core normative questions of uh, a, a conscientious but not necessarily technically savvy individual. Data stories will inform future design choices and policy decisions. They will serve to educate publics and representatives about the stakes at play. And where individuals are still not sufficiently protected, we'll start to see where the regulatory holes are. I want to see more data stories because I think they can change the nature of the conversation that we can have right now. And they can even the pl level the playing field uh, between all interested parties and ground practice ground digital practices in human scale effects. Personal data stories will help us uncover the politics, epistemologies, economies, and ecologies of the socio-technical system <coughs> for which data is becoming the primary substrate. So um, I think this, this idea for personal data stories work is fitting into a much larger uh, emerging suite of tools and practices that expose the themes of data uses and algorithms algorithmic design of our built environment. And so I just wanted to talk about two, uh, how these fit into two other separate um, activities that I see are related. Um, lots of people are creating technical interventions, building tools to make data more legible. So this tool, Immersion, uh, takes your Gmail metadata and exposes it, which allows people to actually comprehend what is embedded in their metadata and what the meaning is in their metadata. And then uh, this is Ben Grosser's uh, Demetricator, which I saw actually at uh, Theorizing the Web this past weekend. Uh, it's a browser plugin that hides Facebook quantifications of likes, friends, timestamps, 
Um, he calls this something that's uh, critical software to reveal how data, how, how Facebook structures its use and possibly addiction uh, with quantification. And Ben actually talked about how uh, exposing or re removing the numbers actually changes people's behaviors. They don't want to be the first one to like or they don't want to be jumping on the bandwagon. And there's another class of interventions which are personal, very personal, but more performative and, and somewhat privileged. So Janet Ver Veresti uh, presented this past weekend also at Theorizing the Web on her infrastructure inversion project. She hid her pregnancy from the internet by using cash, browsing maternity websites with Tor, and asking her family members and friends not to write about her pregnancy even on private Facebook messages. Uh, it's a really compelling story and you should all watch it. Um, I can send, the, send around the link. Um, and then in her recent book, Julia Angwin takes extreme measures to prevent tracking and protect her privacy over the course of an entire year. She used a Faraday case for her mobile phone and she even created a fake identity, Ida Tarbell, uh, to, sep <laughs> to separate out uh, her commercial activity online. So I really like these examples, uh, as, but they're as much performance as they are an experiment. They piece, they're performance pieces uh, to demonstrate actually the futility of perfect privacy as a goal. And so in that sense, they don't depict the practicalities of everyday life, except in the ways that privacy protection hampers life. And in contrast, I think my goal in talking about personal stories from average consumers is to help ground the trade-offs and better inform practical decisions in everyday life. So my interest in telling these data, personal data stories is grounded in a larger vein of technological criticism. In much the same way that cultural and film critics discuss what's important and interesting about a cultural artifact, uh, technology critics could undercover both the artistic cultural importance of technologies as media, as well as the power dynamics inherent in technologies as political artifacts. Technology criticism should explore our relationship to the firms and the governments as, indi as, as uh, individuals and as societies. So I'm advocating for technology criticism with an ant anthropological flavor. And so to that end, I have a pitch for you today. Uh, I want to build a column for telling personal data stories. It would look like something like the haggler or the consumerist, but for data and algorithms specifically. I think there needs to be a platform to be able to tell these stories with some regularity and some consistency. The format would be similar, investigate into a particular case to solve a personal problem while exposing the larger systemic issue at hand. The column would be a means to surface more of these stories, explain them for an individual, describe their... Uh, their case and its impact on that person, and reveal what's going on for the rest of us. Data stories will also serve to develop our attention and to notice and scrutinize when we come across something uh, over the course of our digital lives. So I think about this in terms of like maybe a, a regular column in a popular publication, largely for a lay audience rather than a technical audience. Um, at the very least, I think it could be a single purpose uh, website to collect and share data stories. So I'm absolutely open to suggestions and um, alternatives. And I wanted to finish out by, I couldn't not include a picture of a cat um, <laughs> for an internet talk. Um, but I want to make a call for personal stories. I want your feedback. I want to hear your thoughts. Um, this is completely a work in progress and I want to start getting it off the ground. So I need help to solicit some of these consumer stories. Um, so uh, do you have questions and personal encounters with data that you want to share? And I want to open up, up to the room, too. Um, do you have screen, screen captures of weird things that have happened? Um, what are, or what are some of the compelling uh, examples that have really changed the way that you think about your relationship to data and its uses? So um, with that, I just want to open up the floor for, for questions. Thank you. Um, a lot of these systems seem to depend on knowing who they people are, building up huge databases about them. Are there any systems that can operate without knowing who they people are, just sort of anonymously reading their um, choices and uh, guesses about what they are doing on the internet, sort of trying to target using that system? Mm. I guess, so it, uh, the distinction I think is 
I mean, there are plenty of um, tools that are talking about like everything is double hashed and it's all protected and you're not really knowing an individual, but I guess it's how you define like how knowing an individual is, right? Like, do you define that by a name or do you define it by a series of behaviors? And, and to me, I think the line between like identity and uh, activity is, is one that's blurry to me. Does that make sense? I see your point. I was thinking more of their objective not to be to um, take a person's name and build up a history behind it, but to just understand an identity and target it accordingly. Does any system have that as their objective instead of actually finding out who the person is? Um, I'm, I'm sure there are like technical structures that would allow for that, but I'm just I'm struggling to come up with examples off the top of my head. Um, web search is like that, right? I mean, the ads that you see depends on your past history and your query results. So Google does not always try to identify or this is John or whatever. But they keep a profile of your past searches and past queries. Right. right. I so mean, that's like, how you, you see that. So that's what Google does. Yeah. yeah. You don't need to. Know, they don't need to know it's <laughs> you or me or whatever. It's they care about whether I search for a plane ticket, then they start showing me. So right. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, but that's the line between like browser cookies versus like you can use Google and it will pull your browser cookies without being logged in. But then when you log in, it's a it's another different experience. Profile, right. 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 <coughs> But the systems in place like this, this is more of a heuristic organic process. They look at the large scale of all your activity on the entire internet. Yeah. Not a personal story, but I have a friend online who basically said, well, I appreciate you know that I'm seeing these ads for this thing while I was searching for it, but now that I've bought it, I'm sort of like not to see any more of those ads. Is there some way to tell it that I've actually bought this thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would yeah. love to see that. I think, I think right now it's really, it's back to this uncanny valley point, which is, um, for example, a loyalty card does not necessarily sync up with your browser cookies. Like it's so one company which you are very loyal to does not know that you purchased something in person, uh, or hasn't kind of like resolved the ad network with yeah. the credit card network. Um, David, um, toward the beginning of your talk, you spoke about kind of wanting to look inside the data black box. I was wondering if when you've talked to people at Facebook and other places, they've sort of said, well. The black box is just too complicated. Even the people running the algorithms just don't really know what happens. There's you know thousands of parameters, and they maybe said, "Well, we don't know. Maybe no human can hold all the complexity in your head of the interaction." Right. Yeah, I, and I think that's one limitation of, of even advocating for like we just need to understand how this works better. Um, it's the kind of uh, like knowability problem. So. I think there is some extent to which like no having more concrete examples of the effects at least help us understand how this thing is being used and I, I mean it in the most like basic sense right like is this marketing data being used for uh, insurance underwriting purposes like mm -hmm. I think it gets back to this problem which is that all the data begins one place but its uses are infinite, right? And we haven't really put limits on what appropriate uses are. And so that, that gets more towards this like regulatory discussion of like, well, we're going to say that no marketing data will not be used for uh, insurance underwriting, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we can't really talk about that until we know that it is being used that way. So. Sarah, this is really interesting, and I'm one of the things that I think would be, I don't know, this is just to throw it out as a suggestion, but it seems like, I know there are tools out there that let you easily compare legal documents, like a privacy policy of, say, Facebook, mm -hmm. because they do change quite a bit. And the other thing that seems really, this is such a moving target, these stories, which are so, I, I feel like this would be really valuable. But of course, like a story today might shift in the future by policy and practice of these big companies. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if, but back to, what I was just picturing is like some way in which you could have a, the privacy policy of Facebook say, and then as you read through it as a reader, you could have links to your stories or like an annotation where it said like, for this policy, which sounds really hard to read legalese for a lot of people, here's like a related story that illustrates that. Yeah. Like, so you'd have these stories as a kind of a little gems along through 
what is an explainer to the legal documents of big privacy sort of data collectors. Right. I, yeah. I don't know. I would think that'd be a fun sort of way to try to, uh, well, useful. Right. Way. Making it actually concrete and in, in and just ha have a way to yeah. archive them. Yeah. And you'd have to make sure you said like on I mean, you know July 2013 or July 2014. Right. Or whatever. The the flip version of that is when Facebook um, introduced graph search. They like made it personal uh, walkthrough. Basically, it oh. wasn't a video. It was actually like you walking through your. Facebook profile and like here let me teach you how to search for friends obviously they were encouraging you to learn the service right they added their copy to, spin on to it to apply right to apply the same uh, logic to the privacy policies is great yeah your idea for a column on this is fabulous thank you <laughs> oh my gosh it's a great idea um, let me just ask you a couple of questions about your your vision of that or mm -hmm. the intention or what it could accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, because at the very beginning you said, you know, that place where the discovery that if it's free you're the product and that we're past that. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that if you were doing a column in a magazine or a newspaper, a lay column, um, that the audience is not past that. And that the um, the function of the column would be consciousness raising, mm -hmm. that it would be a revelation to most readers that this stuff is going on. So it's not yet at the building critical literacies, but it could be leading toward building critical literacy. So those would be layered. Mm -hmm. And um, then I also want to ask you about the black box thing, because the critical literacies may be impossible to achieve by definition, mm -hmm. because the black box is actually designed to be black. Right. And so you can you can take like little pinpricks maybe, and you get a little peephole, tiny little peephole. But <laughs> so for a projet <laughs> for you, I mean, just so if you start if you start with consciousness raising, mm -hmm. um, and then you, and then that creates capabilities for critical literacies, but the critical literacies are right now impossible to achieve because the thing that you want to be literate about is by design illegible, right? So then you're into politics. Right. And so I was just wondering if you had thought about that, you know, if you were looking at it in a multi-layered way where, yeah, you start with consciousness raising, but I also have thoughts about you know how you mobilize politics with that consciousness, mm -hmm. because with it without the politics, you can never have the literacy. Right. That's my point. Yeah. No, I I completely take your point, and I think uh, my my instinct in trying to kind of unbox the black box is that they are intended to be black, but they are not. Um, I, I think some of all these examples are where it. The, the seams kind of expose themselves and that's where we can like, like that envelope a little bit spill out right exactly and so we just have to be able to know where to look for those clues I think and so even that is the uh, consciousness raising or like a yeah. skill set to say yeah. as a consumer like huh that's weird and not just be like that's that's really weird and go on with your day but send it off somewhere to like try to figure out what the heck is going on um, so I think there there is a step towards the column even being a way to teach people to notice that fluke moment. Um, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I would say too but, that you can't yeah. you can't you're not going to get the public policy debate if you don't have the critical literacy. No, that's what right. I said. And it's, the demand, it's, it's, right? It's right. a layering. Right. And I, I was just you know curious if you. Yeah. Projected well, yourself down that right, down right. that path. And well, and I think path. it. It does start to fit in. Like there has been a lot of activity in discussing data broker practices right now, and so it's not a not it's not a non-issue politically, um, but I think it's still really hard to understand the edges or the the kind of contours of what we're talking about because we still don't know where the contours are. Um, but, but even if you even if you try to regulate data brokers, they'll just go offshore. So what does it matter? Right. 
So, so because the internet is, there is no border on the internet. That's why the NSA hits us at home and abroad, because there's no, there's right. no, there's no dividing line. Right. So there, it's, it's, it'll just, it's kind of like a feudal battle. Right. Well, and to that end, so Axiom, I, I, I should give them credit because they are leading the edge in trying to get ahead of this for obvious, uh, like, pre-regulatory reasons. They are allergic to that uh, discussion. Um, so they're starting to say things like, well, we need to have this, like, better privacy policy within the big data broker industry or this privacy protecting um, concept in general. And uh, Scott Howe of Axiom has already come out and said, well, the data broker industry should just say, we will not use this data for um, insurance purposes or loan, uh, loan financing. But it's one thing to say that. Previously, they have said things to the effect that, like, well, our customers, like, we don't even know what our customers do with our data. So there's no kind of uh, enforcement potential there. My, my only thing, I keep waiting for a story to break about some kind of really weird stalker who, who gets very savvy with this kind of data. Mm. And like, like uh, California just brought out the law um, against revenge porn. And so, you know, and all these stories of personal horror finally motivated lawmakers to try and at least do something. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what is your take, sorry if I may ask a question, mm -hmm. what is your take on um, this sort of MIT is, and I'm sure you know about this, MIT is getting ready to make email, content of people's email and their MIT student accounts, property of the students. Mm -hmm. And there's Omelette, which is sort of the, <laughs> this uh, social media thing, you know, where you own the data of, of the Omelette app. Okay, so I'm not familiar with so that I, 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 I kind of keep wondering when people are going to realize that free is actually expensive. And if you paid a little bit of money for something you spend all of your time using and pour your whole life into, even though HTTPS, and now Internet Explorer, and basically everything that you use that's digital is not <coughs> actually secure ever, because every measure has a countermeasure. Right. It's like an endless sort of arms race. Yeah. Um, I think at some point... I personally would rather pay, like, like I love watching the BBC, so I, I wish I could pay a BBC TV license instead of using a VPN to hack into it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think at some point we're all going to just sort of wake up and say, you know, I'm spending $100 or 150 or $200 a month on digital services. Why don't I spend another 50 and own my digital life? So is it too late? Well, it the could be. Is so far out It could be, two. but my son is, is eight. Yeah. So he would have a chance at right. some privacy in his digital life. Right. But do we want to tie, like, financials to privacy rights? What right. do you mean? Well, I mean, and, <laughs> and I would go, I would go even further and say that it's not necessarily. I'm sorry, I don't mean understand your question. I just mean for people who can't afford to buy the privacy technology. The, then, then it should be a subsidized guarantee by the government as part of your basic freedoms, and we have to advance sort of uh, personal norms to include that. But, but I to would, have a functioning socio-technical right. experience where data is the substrate, which is the line of yours that I love, right. and I'll quote. Um, so I think I would go further and say, so I actually like to talk about this stuff not in terms of privacy and privacy rights, but just in terms of like manipulation and like um, kind of predatory uses of data. And I think that goes beyond just like a, a vague sense of well, should you know or know about that? Know or not know about this? But it's it's going further and saying, how does the use of this data foreclose my like ability as a human being to make choices or or to make uh, to understand my world? Um, it's a subtle so, distinction. I'm but, still trying to but, like. But so so it's yeah. just be that Jacques Attali uh, spoke at Harvard last Monday, and he talked about a service a friend runs in New York, where based on a book of his he wrote in '77 about music that you can actually, they can actually determine your credit history based on the kinds of music you listen to and where you live. Mm -hmm. And so this, they just mine 500 million data points in music and they've nailed everybody just based on music press. Yeah. I did, I, Sorry. Uh, That's okay. I like the basic um, approach you're taking and I think the idea of coming up with data stories, personal stories makes a lot of sense. Can I just add a little complexity Absolutely. Uh, to this, Please because do. what you have is very tidy, mm -hmm. but there are some complications. One is the generational differences, um, generational attitudes towards um, authority. I'm the irony of the boomers um, never trusting anyone over 30, 
them bringing up a generation whose parents are their best friends. Mm -hmm. um, that's, they have very different views of, of authority figures and therefore who manages their information. Mm -hmm. The other important issue is um, just the basic economics of the net. Mm -hmm. um, for some very strange reason, we ended up with free. Um, and you, there is no such thing as free. So someone had to pay. And it's the advertisers who pay. Um, and who will continue to pay? It's too late to um, ask people to pay. Um, there have been attempts, but it doesn't succeed. So it's really changing the attitudes of the advertisers that will change the behaviors. If they see an economic benefit in acting differently, they will. Um, one of the other problems of all of this is the, um, which I get inklings of in some of your um, stories, is the attitude towards um, big data. Um, big data. I sort of bristle at, I guess I'm old enough to resist some new terms. Um, it, it just evokes the idea of the electronic brain that original computers, the fantasy of. Um, just because it's big data doesn't mean they, there are smart people using it. So Absolutely. It, so so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make it any smarter. And believe me, as you know, the computers themselves don't have any intelligence. But I'd like to bring up a different direction that I think the advertisers will follow which will change their behavior. Um, one of the things that, that I do is um, work on community building. And community building will be one of the major buzzwords for online marketers. And the big difference in community building is instead of the oppositional us versus them, cons consumer and um, company selling things or the government, instead you have companies realizing that if they have consumers meet each other online, and reveal data to each other that's of interest to them, then that can still benefit the advertiser. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of that in politics, where we put people together who have the same attitudes. Mm -hmm. So, and you're starting to see that move into retail and in other directions, where people who buy shoes together, people who discuss clothes together, build communities, and they want to reveal that data. Mm -hmm. So I think that will create a, a natural shift. So I think we have to sort of wait, either wait or help the market shift rather than try to impose a new way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Peter, did you have something? Yeah, I, Sarah, my st story would be that a year ago I, I decided that I didn't want Google knowing what I was doing. So started using DuckDuckGo. Mm -hmm. And after about a month, I gave it up because <laughs> the results were just not clearly as good. Mm -hmm. um, that Google knew what I was searching for, mm -hmm. and the results are more um, effective. And when you, and I sort of would like the idea if Disney could figure out how to make Walt Disney World someplace I would ever want to go again, <laughs> and, uh, and and make it more efficient. So there's a certain amount where um, uh, the data. Uh, brokers are, can make our lives more efficient, more focused, speak more to us. And if there are bad data brokers, uh, when they're giving you a cheese board uh, when you don't want it, uh, that's a sign that uh, they're not doing a very good job and they're going to go out of business. And so th uh, that eventually the algorithms need to get um, better and better. So right. what's your response to, to the idea that that somehow it, you know, it's, there's not much to worry about here. Right, no, I t totally take your point. I think my instinct is, is to go to the idea that those, what all of what you just listed are appropriate uses of that data, right? I think, and we know generally what the trade-off is, you, you logging into Google is going to give you better results and that is a clear, whoops, that's fine, um, is a clear, um, benefit and trade-off and you have decided that, that is a trade-off that you are willing to make um i think there's a lot of things that are far more hidden like all these you know data broker examples where you don't see why somebody would want to know that your daughter was killed in a car crash uh, and so there's i think that to me the distinction is a lot about we see pretty clearly what the good uses are right now but we haven't gotten a lot of visibility on the more nefarious uses. And so we need to like tackle those. Does you that? Think, you think it, that's a nefarious use? If I was trying to sell something to someone, 
I think it'd be very helpful to know that that person's daughter died in a car crash. And so I would know that there may be certain kinds of advertisements that would not have a, um, uh, that would not have a negative response mm -hmm. um, at that point. So yes, it's unfortunate it showed up that way, but it still seems like it could be valuable data to have. Uh, it, but it also varies would be if, if you could figure out that somebody had an addictive personality and then you started sending ads to Oreos. Uh, yeah, or Twinkies to them, um, maybe that would be a problem. But. Right. Well, so the example, following up on that, that I've been thinking about lately is like, okay, you have your Internet of Things fridge, which has, which has learned your um, eating behaviors and preferences, and even though theoretically you shouldn't be eating a lot of Oreos, it just keeps ordering them for you automatically when you start okay. to run out. Okay. And, you know, there's this kind of line between like libertarian paternalistic internet of things and just like exploitative internet of things so somewhere i, I feel like it lies somewhere in in between those what is good for us and to what ends and to what purposes and the other example i really like is what if that information is used for uh targeting predatory loans and being a proxy for um credit scores that that low income populations do just don't have um and th that data ends up being essentially proxies for discrimination based on race and things like that. So it's not race, but it's, well, you use Twitter a lot and you have a phone package that is uh, month to month. And there you go. Um, did, were you, Tim, were you going to say something? No. Okay. Kendra? <laughs> the stories you talked about had this sort of like very personal, very intimate quality to them. So they were sort of like, it was so shocking because it was a pregnancy or it was like a family death or it was like something about your relationship. And I was, I'm wondering if you think that those are the type of stories that are like sort of most effective at getting at like some of the big data problems or if there are other stories that are potentially like cover some of the same areas or like what, if you can talk a little bit more about like how, how the sort of valence of the story changes people's perception of the mm. data. Yeah, I think, thank you for pointing that out because it is good. Um, kind of thread throughout them. I think I think there is some instinct that it is uh, very personal. It makes it as personal as it can possibly be. Like your family, your body, um, your sense of self is really tied up in all these things. Um, I guess I'm trying to think of other examples that are a little less, um, less heavy. <laughs> Tim? Yeah. One is a dad busted his daughter uh, having a New Year's Eve party when the rest of the family was out of town by noticing on the smart meter an unusual high use of electricity. Right. And number two is uh, there has been a lot of use in New York in particular. There was a particular like ring of slum lords who were busted by careful analysis of the communications of their companies and how they were these like shell companies were all tied into to one another and they were able to take down some lords who were making terrible places for people to live right and that was a wonderful thing that that happened hmm. i've occasionally read but i don't really know how much is true of claims that some companies online might just have differential pricing for different people depending on you know who think they are that you know you might buy yeah, you and I might go to the same site and charge you $66, which right. charges me $77 because it thinks I can pay right. more. Does that really happen? And if so... Well, so the good example of that is the um, Orbit story, which was uh, they were not giving differential pricing, but giving uh, displaying different orders of uh, results based on whether or not you were using a Mac or a PC. Macs got a lot higher uh, first choices, and this is back to the like choice architecture. Google, isn't it? Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does, that, does that help answer your question? I don't know. Yeah. 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 But I don't know. I don't know. Is this a widespread practice? And if so, is it? It seems like certainly that's something that would get people's attention. If right. uh, you know, seemingly generic uh, things are being charged different prices to different people without them knowing it. Right. So that's the kind of um, kind of technical intervention that's really heavy lifting to do. And so that, those are harder things to tell as personal stories. But I think they're absolutely 
uh, very interesting and revealing. So I think there are a, um, a fairer number of people uh, experimenting with this by like sandboxing and creating uh, profiles of different people and kind of doing cross, uh, you know, programmatic search queries and things right. like that. Um, and that is beyond the scope of what I am capable of, but I think it's fantastic and I want to see more of that. So, yeah. Um, I wanted to return to your notion of the uncanny valley of uh, personalization, which I find really fascinating. And um, I know that historically, at least, uh, people who build technologies want to avoid the uncanny, um, for example, um, robots that look too lifelike to something that's scary and creepy and we don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if this is um, big data has engaged with the possibility of being too uncanny and therefore off-putting, for example, with the dead daughter example. Right. It's very uncanny. Right. Right. I mean, the, the cheese example to me is more, like, even more uncanny, right? It's like, why do they know how much I like cheese when I'm not even talking about it? Um, yeah, I think, so, I, I'm not sure where if it's really being talked about within like the advertising community or, or people who are trying to just like get ever more perfect information on people. Um, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure what the results would be, right? Like would, would that mean that you make it just like personalized enough, but not too personalized so that it like doesn't jump into a valley or is it this spot where we're we just don't even know how personalized it is, and so we can't understand if it's getting there as a, as a user. I don't know. Does that? Sure, yeah. yeah. I guess this is a question for the future, too. Right, right. Yeah. And like, where our threshold lies as things change and as things get more, um, more smooth, I guess. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I just finally, thank you very much, I finally just figured out why Facebook keeps putting up men's magazines, particularly from Germany and South Africa. I have a German surname, mm. and uh, I, I changed my status as single just as a joke to see what would happen with, joke with some friends, and I think they just thought I must be, start reading men's magazines, like, <laughs> <That's what laughs> and they kept coming do. up in the feed, and I kept saying, I don't want to see this. Right. Yeah, I, I really like those activities where people are like pretending to tweak certain things. So like I have a friend who says she's male on Facebook just to see what happens. Um, what I'll, if you I'll, switch? Huh? If I have, I'm listed as a male, what if I change to female? I wonder what exactly. Would yeah. you would you get Cosmo ads? I don't know. It's a good experiment though. But I, this is what I love. This like how can you? Right. Right. But it's this how do you kind of find ways to tweak your experience and be aware and interested in kind of following what happens? But it's, it's still tea leaf reading, right? Like it's, what does this really mean? Sam? Just really quickly, I'm trying to think of the uh, not next steps here, but uh, I guess my question is who, who do you think ideally should be creating these stories, right? Because you've got like companies that own the data that could potentially create them, but they're probably not so incentivized to. Right. Uh, you know, you could make stories about yourself, but it's very difficult to actually gather enough information. Like you said, most of it's kind of like these incidental, right. accidental things. Right. Right. Or is it, um, you know, should there be people making tools to empower people to make stories about them? What, right. What do you see as like the the best approach thing. Right. I think all of them um, is probably the answer. I think, uh, so even in the example of companies doing this, I think there's a lot of work to be done to just be transparent about what you're doing and understanding how users are inter interacting with your data in a more holistic way and then just like, well, here's the stats on our, like, you know, our, our app is used by 80% teenage girls. Like that's not enough to understand how they're using it or what they think about the data that's being uh, interacted there. So, right, yeah, there is, there is no story there. And so it's it's kind of more an advocacy for like helping other, everyone to learn to how to be like ask eth ethnographically informed questions, which is like a larger um, a larger goal. But um, but even in that sense, I think. Journalists can start asking these questions, but I would I would argue for more like privileging of 
the voice of the individual because oftentimes they just get so sensationalized that they're just like, ha, this happened to one person and you'll never guess what happened next. Um, so does that start yeah. to answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I also think that the other piece of having technolo technologists help uncover these things, and that's an ongoing uh, effort. I think I would, I would love to start like pulling together resources of all those tools that can help consumers play around with this and kind of experiment too. Yeah, I agree. I think the pairing of technologists and people who think that they maybe have like a nugget of something that exactly. is evidence of an algorithm or just an experience like right. this. And it's really about connecting those people to be able to start telling the stories together because that's really the challenge here is that they are technical problems but they're also very much personal like social stories to be told. Thinking it through. Um, I noticed one other thing, which is, um, you know, the consciousness raising aspect of it, which is an aspect of a, of a lot of this discussion, um, it's really exciting. And then I, I began to think about another potential side of it, which is possibly more disturbing, which is habituation. Mm. So I was thinking about, like, those columns that started Miss Manners. Right, so when Miss Manners started, it was, there's a framework of rules, and could you please inform me what is the correct rule? Mm. Right? So that was, how do I fit in and be correct? That was what Miss Manners was. Right. And then, as the process of individualization progressed in the 20th century, <laughs> on the meta level, <laughs> Um, you know, then it turned to Dear Abby, because then it was, well, I'm in a situation and there are no rules. And so I really have to make it up, and could you help me figure out how to make it up? Mm -hmm. You with me? So there's that shift. <clears throat> but then Dear Abby, which started off, you know, like Descartes, wow, I'm inventing something, um, ended up being habituated, mm. you know, because it was... It was just, it became nothing, mm -hmm. routine. So um, given the political context of this, mm -hmm. um, it would be really sad if these data stories just became habituated, you know, just became routine. Like, oh, yeah, that happened to you. Well, look at this that happened to me. And, you know, mm -hmm. so I just wanted to put that out there because um, I I'm inferring from your work that you would not you would not be aiming for habituation. No. You would be aiming for something much more critical. Right. And so then the question arises, well, are there I don't know what the answer is, but just how do you how do you move forward with this idea to sort of raise the probability that it has that the impact, yeah. That impact effect and lower the probability that it leads to um, routinization. Mm, yeah. I, I mean, I think one piece of it is just in integrating the more kind of um, power dynamic story into it. So addressing both the interests of the individual that and the interests key. of yeah. the you know, data broker or whoever, whoever the kind of or the target polis. is. Right. And, and I think there, it, it's hard to tell those stories with an even keel to cover yeah. everyone's interests. Yeah. Um, but at least there's a step towards like, well, you know, you could do one thing, but you know, their, their instinct about regulating this is this and, but make the argument that, you know, Consumers still need to be protected, blah blah blah. So I, I feel like there's room for dialogue, it's but I don't know. Yeah. Something to be <laughs> right. It also yeah. probably depends a lot where the column ends up, and you know, all of these. Well, you choose. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Yeah. So I have a theory on where this is going to go. I think people are going to want to own their data, mm -hmm. so they'll pay to own it, but they'll still want to be able to participate in information sharing with companies and so on. So an intermediary will arise that you will then transact to represent you anonymously with all of these other entities mm -hmm. so that you can participate in community building while still maintaining the privacy of what you're, who you are. Right. This is the like, kind of data locker model, right? Or some, like data third party. 
Sorry? They also call personal data stores. Right, personal data stores that are acting on your behalf. But you still have to trust them, so yeah. How is that different from, say, Google currently is incredibly careful about protecting my data from advertisers because that's what Google sells to advertisers. It's like advertisers have a terrible time at doing anything other than like sending requests. Like the black box works both ways right now. Right. Like the Google store, the Google is the data store. And we generally trust it in the way that we trust it. Yeah, data our behavior store. indicates right. Right. that we trust. It. <laughs> we, <laughs> the real we. <laughs> what you define as a vector of trust. I mean, just because I trust Google to give me good search results doesn't mean that I necessarily um, trust what else they're going to do with the data of right. my search results. Or right. there could just be an, an unexpected breach and somebody just takes everything out of Google and, and right. it becomes harvested on the net and then mm -hmm. we're in a whole new world. Yeah. Awesome. Maggie? I'm going to channel a question from Earhart and I also have somewhat oh, of my maybe. own answer that maybe I'll share after he's Okay, started. thank you. But his question is, could your theory of change include stories if they exist where people benefited from personal data collection? Oh, yes. So quantify itself. Yay. Yay. Um, <laughs> right. So I didn't I didn't talk extensively about that, but that's kind of where this is some of this is coming from, where it's a very very much a personally empowered interaction with data collection and data uses and data outcomes. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where I'm coming at this from is a, a particular group of people who are uh, slightly more technically savvy and have have good outcomes. I just wanted to follow up with yeah. like your, your idea for a column. So uh, in Quantified Self, we're actually working on a project about trying to share more people's personal stories. So we should definitely talk. Okay. Um, <laughs> great. So I think this is a great idea because we're already trying to do something very similar. So great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I just. Uh, you guys can really comment, but I just cannot get around. I mean, I've had a different question that we've all with. I can't get around the fact that in the recent history of market research, there has been extreme deception. Mm -hmm. Deception as in like fraud? Mm -hmm. or? And like if you go back to the, I mean, this process was going on before, but if you go back to the 90s, television survey and television, I mean, not tell, telephone. Telephone research was complete deception. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were telling people at that time, that you want to talk to them about product development, and you're in fact collecting uh, discovery, mm -hmm. exchanging discovery between you know legal departments and large companies. Mm -hmm. You have uh, field research at you know shopping malls. And it's nothing to do with product development. You have focus groups which have nothing to do with product development. Mm -hmm. But people are have this illusion that that's what that's about. Mm -hmm. Maybe in France, but not here. <laughs> right. Well, and that that still gets back to what is the original intended use of the data and what is the potential use of the data? I mean, data mining right. was going on at the same time that in the 90s that, that, that you know, what we took for to be product development market research, you know, you pick up the phone, you talk to them about Colgate toothpaste or whatever, right. was becoming something that, you know, not what people thought it was. Right. Yeah. I mean, why would, why would, I mean, I worked for these companies downtown. You know, I mean, why would you, why would you talk to people who, who you know, who are only over 70? If you were trying to sell them a new toothpaste. Right, right. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. All right, so it seems like um, the stories as you collect them are going to separate into two groups. One is um, stupid, the other is evil. And the stupid <laughs> is the sending out the, the email with daughter deceased. That's just stupid. Right. Clearly, there was no intent to do that. Evil is what isn't being described yet, but the offshoot of Arvid's charging different amounts is sort of a digital Jim Crow. Right. I could decide, you're never going to buy my product. I'm not going to offer it to you right. <laughs> because you're not the right demographic. Right. And all of a sudden, you have people shut out without even realizing it. And that starts verging on evil. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts of trying to, I think which side you're going to be on or which. Uh, Not which in favor of, but as far as which you <laughs> emphasize, <laughs> you're going to have to do some selection on the stories that come in. Right. So if you if you champion to fight the evil, right. or if you just point out how stupid the right. advertisers are. I mean, I think the more the merrier. Um, in a certain sense, uh, I think it all gives us more insight into what is happening. Keep going. It will happen from the other side as well. 
there are some examples on manipulating apps. Like there is an app called Waze. It was a very popular example. Some student hacked into it, so they start creating fake location information. So the app start thinking that there is a, some kind of congestion. So start directing other people. So you get your highway for yourself, for example. Yeah. So I think the data mining also the evil part works on the other way as well. So I, for example, because of this Mac thing, I use a virtual machine on my like Windows machine. So when I want to buy something, I use Windows basically. So I, just to avoid those kind of Mac things. So I think the data manipulation evil could happen on the other side. As sure, well. like Google bombing, yeah. you can. That's an example of the users. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I have a whole. I have lots of feelings on Google, um, but <laughs> we won't get into that. Um, well, thank you, everyone, so much for for joining me today. And, um, if you if you have other ideas or want to make connections, please do email me or get in touch on Twitter or however you prefer. Um, thank you.